so I wanted to know more about it. So I wrote up an uh, email and sent it to my Hopi friend, and she writes me back and she says, never heard of it. <laughs> I, said, I didn't make this up. So uh, I sent her copies of the stuff I've been reading about it, and she sent me back an email. She said, oh, if that's already out in the public, I can talk about it. And in fact, I just made a quilt with Piccolo Woody in it. Oh, oh so really? This, this is her quilt that she made. Oh, there it, it is. So this is the modern day version of what you're oh, seeing up there. I see it. So what's interesting is they tell us that most of this rock art, you can't take, you can't take a figure of a, I'm just pointing this out, this is called a rake. It's a horizontal line with vertical lines coming down. It looks like a thunderstorm. But it also could be the wing of a bird with feathers coming down, which is symbolic of shamanic flight, of the shaman going on a vision quest into the, the inner world. But normally I missed you that. Can't, where, where was that again? Right over here, and it's hard for you to see it. You know, I'm being unfair by picking this out. You know, but it's hard for you to see it over uh, there. Uh, but anyway, just the point I'm trying to make is that normally you can't take a piece of rock art from, from this place and yeah. say that it means the same thing as one oh. that you get over in Mesa Verde or Canyon de Shea, because they're in completely different contexts maybe by completely different people, so they would have a completely different meaning. Yeah. And so you're really stretching it to say that. The only exception that I've been able to find is the story of Tikwa Woody, because here she is <coughs> in Petrified Forest National Monument, the same oh. portrait oh. <coughs> of a woman giving birth to all the game animals of the world. Wow. Yeah. And then here's another one, on the little Colorado River, where she's giving birth to all the game animals of the world. She just doesn't look as happy in this one as she does in the other. So the significance of it, though, is the fact that a thousand years ago, the same story is being told in many different locations, same culture, people, it's the same story. And that's why I was curious about it and talked to my Hopi friend about it. And she said, well, we usually have three names for things. We have a name that children are told when they're growing up that something they have. And then as an adult, then they have another name. And then as a ceremonial situation, it would have a third name. So Tikwa Woody is the name that we tell children that she has. But she says, I can't tell you her other names because those are things that are, are ethically unforbidden to impart that information. So oh. that's why she couldn't talk about it in the first place. Oh. And she said, as long as that stuff is out in the public, I can talk about it. She said, my clan is not a hunting clan. And this is a hunting scene. And she said, what I do know about it is this, that when the hunters were going to go out and hunt these animals, that they would have to come here and ask for her permission to do so in the first place because they're asking to take her children. Uh -oh. And then if they were successful in the hunt, they would come back here and make offerings to her and thank her. Because the last thing when you, you believe in a spirit world, the last thing you want is the spirit to be angry with you and be seeking revenge against you. So you want to keep things in balance. So if you took something from her, you would want to give something back to her to reciprocate for it, to make sure that you go to sleep at night and wake up live in the morning instead of the other way. So um, at least she would give me that, that kind of information. So just as an aside, for about a week this summer, we had a rattlesnake sitting right up in the no. street. And then about a month ago, I had a picture of it. Okay, now we're watching. Yeah, we had a, you ever seen one of these giant centipedes? Oh, oh disgusting, yes. Yeah. We had a giant centipede. <laughs> Crawling around here? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I didn't in the know summer? they were Here he is here. In the summer. Oh, God. The How's one on the How right. long is that? He's about 12 inches long. Wow, how cool. Ooh. Disgusting. And they're, ven they're venomous. And they're venomous? Oh, wow. Yes. Where's so the, the, the picture to the left of them is a rock art oh, yeah. portrait of a centipede yeah. out here. And so normally you see these centipedes, and I had read 
But the centipede. Oh yeah. The centipede was a transitional animal between the world of the living and the world of the dead. And so that's why you often see them near cracks in rocks because yeah. they're showing that they can go back and forth between oh. between them. Oh. So I looked them up on uh, Wikipedia, and they have between 19 and 23 pairs of legs. And so I thought, well, I'll count them in these because there's lots of these rock art portraits of centipedes. And sure enough, they all have between 19 and 23 hmm. pairs of legs, so they knew what they were sketching out of these things as well. So I think they're pretty neat, but a lot of people think they're not. So uh, 1924, Charles Willard came out here. He homesteaded this property. It took him two years to build the house. That's the uh, visitor center here. This is a picture of Charles Willard and when he came out here from Cottonwood. He's known as the father of Cottonwood. And so, uh, if you like, he lived in a cave up here for the two years he was building the house, and then you go visit that cave. So just as we're going up there, it gets narrower and rockier, and the wall of the cave is very fragile. So if you have a tendency to reach out with your hands and balance yourself, just don't touch the wall. And if you're gonna fall over, please fall over your right hand. <laughs> stylized and then along here are four these are called I didn't know this St. Andrew's crosses yeah. they're the sign of the Hopi sand clan and then neck up here is some off-white color yeah. uh, pictographs that they believe are Apache so Apache oh. rock art is very rare so this is some of that and then something that's really rare is this figure here He's a humpback flute player. There's about 2,300 of them depicted in the Southwest, and only three where he's being carried. So he's not this guy. Oh, yeah. He's this guy here. I oh, got This you. is his flute. This is his head, his hands, and his legs. So I asked my hopey friend about it. I said, why would they have the humpback flute player being carried? And she said, we have a story, and it's a symbiotic relationship of a blind man and a crippled man, and the crippled man is being uh, being the eyes uh, for the guy that's he, that's carrying him. Wow. So they worked out this relationship mm. to them. And what the rest of the story is, I don't remember. <laughs> that was the part I didn't remember. That's the CRA? Yeah. That was my And then one of his inventions is up on the rock at home. Huh? The water trough. You see this box up on the rock? So you trap water from the rain. Oh, there. oh that box. Yeah. Oh, that's the water box. Oh, that's cool. Excuse me. You may be crying up that rock for nothing. 
The tailors are on their way. Sort of. Sort of. So why don't you, the rest of y'all come in here and let the tailors... That'll be nice, I can hear you. <laughs> You're eavesdropping. <laughs> so I was showing them that uh, on the rock over here is, is one of Charles Roy's inventions, which was a uh, water catchment device, a big metal box. He had a pipe at the end of it, so he had water uh, coming down here for his habitation. So this was his, this is actually his uh, wedding picture. So he's known as the father of Cottonwood. If you go to Cottonwood, the medical center is on Willard Street. His wife passed away in 1924, and that's when he came out here. And this is a picture of Charles Willard really that blocked it. And he had, had it under cultivation. So he had an area where you park your car, and, and uh, that side of the road, he had up to 2,000 fruit and nut trees growing there. And this is 1929, what Palaki looked like. Oh, wow. oh, Where would he have gotten the trees? Did he plant them from seed? Yeah, he, probably, he might have gone to, to uh, somewhere in California or something. His family originally came from Nevada, and they were cattle ranchers, and they settled in Cottonwood in 1879. It was one of the oldest families here. And uh, his sister was, her name was Frances Willard Munn, and she was the first woman elected to the state legislature in Arizona. Wow. So if you're around here long enough, you'll see Munn's Mountain, and Munn's sure. Wagon yeah. Trail, and yeah. Munn's Park. And that was the family she married into. And then their grandfather, his name was Alexander Hamilton Willard. And he was the second to last survivor of the Lewis and Clark expedition wow. in 1924. So, in, uh, if you go to Cottonwood, the oldest home in Cottonwood is the Willard home, which was his mother's home. And it's right in Old Town Cottonwood next to my favorite retail outlet, which is called the Hippie Emporium. Mm -hmm. So you can <laughs> stop at the Hippie Emporium and get you a tie-dyed shirt and see this house without moving your car. So, <laughs> So in the late spring, we can't come in here because we get a colony of bats that lives up in here. And they're called Townsend's Big Ear Bat. And this is a Townsend's Big Ear Bat. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. So to get an idea of how big they really are, you'll see me holding them. So it's only the females during part of their pregnancy that don't give birth here. And uh, then they leave, so they're here for about a month. And the state biologist comes and counts the number of bats coming in and out. So after Charles Willard uh, moved into the house, he kept his chickens in here. That's why there's the chicken wire up here, and that's also why they call this Willard's Roost. So around the corner from here is a place called the uh, Bear Alcove. And the Bear Alcove has a plastered floor, which means that it was an ancient uh, Native American habitation, but it doesn't have a front wall to it. It has a, a back rock shelter to it. And we think that Charles Willard, instead of hoarding bricks up here for the, a wall for his shelter here, he imported the rocks from the Indian uh, dwelling and brought them over here. So he did a lot of good stuff around here, and he did some stuff that wasn't so good. So his idea for this orchard was to have have something bigger than what we looked at in the photograph here and so his water source for the orchard was a spring that's around the corner from here and uh, what he did was he had a, a catchment area below the spring and uh, he would let, let the water accumulate in that catchment area and he would had a door on it, and he would pull the door up and it would flow out into a canal that he built that went, you walked along uh, the side of it coming up here. So that water would go all the way down to his field, the irrigator's field. And so he wanted it to be twice as big as this. So he went up there one day with some dynamite and blew up that spring and stopped it up completely. So by 1937, he couldn't farm here anymore, and so he moved back to Cottonwood.
He died in 1957 at the age of 99. As I said, he's the father of Cottonwood. If you're playing a trivial pursuit game about Cottonwood, <laughs> it'll help you out a lot. <laughs> so he was intending to improve the stuff. Yeah. Trying to get more water out of it. Hmm. So, we have two groups of people here. Some people came before the others, or do you all come together? I think we're all in one group. Okay. Yeah. So, we'll kind of go back to the beginning and talk about a few things if you want to. Okay. I'm looking for my eggs. 